The meeting between the Pacific Fleet senior officers from Leningrad with Admiral Emil Spiridonov had gone well. The Soviet leader was pleased with the work of the Naval Command, and they now had to return to work. After the event wrapped up on February 7, 1981, the Admiral and 43 top-ranking Soviet Navy personnel boarded a Tu-104 airliner to be transported from Leningrad to their headquarters in Vladivostok on the Pacific coast. The afternoon was snowy, but the conditions were good enough for takeoff. Lieutenant Colonel Anatoly Inyushin then took the aircraft into the air, but suddenly it pitched abnormally, rolled to the right, nearly inverted, and plummeted to the ground. An immense fireball engulfed the scene. In a matter of seconds, the Soviet Navy had lost no less than 28 high-ranking officials, mainly from the Pacific Fleet. And to the remaining leaders of the crippled service, it seemed obvious what such a tragedy meant. It must have been an enemy attack. The Tupolev Tu-104 As the Cold War started and the jet era began, the Soviet Union needed a more modern airliner with enhanced capabilities and more efficient performance than their somewhat obsolete piston aircraft in operation at the time. Tupolev OKB responded to the design request and based their new model on their Tu-16 Badger, retaining the strategic bomber's wings, engines, and tail surfaces. Also, the new airliner featured a wider, pressurized fuselage that could accommodate 50 passengers. The airliner flew for the first time in mid-1955, and it carried a drag parachute to shorten its landing distance, as most airports lacked long enough runways. Then, towards the end of the year, the first serial aircraft took to the skies. Powered by two Makulin AM-3 turbojets fitted in the wing routes, the Tu-104 resembled the de Havilland Comet, and in fact, was the second jet airliner to enter regular service. But unlike the Comet, which was grounded due to safety concerns, the first Soviet jet airliner continued to operate, becoming the only one in service from 1956 to 1958. The aircraft was narrow-bodied and uniquely decorated. Its interior was called Victorian, according to some Westerners, and used luxurious materials, including mahogany, copper, and lace. As for its crew, the complement consisted of two pilots, a navigator, a flight engineer, and a radio operator, which was later removed. Pilots were trained on the IL-28 bomber, and then on an unarmed Tu-16 painted in the Aeroflot Airlines colors, flying mail between Moscow and Sverdlovsk. Those with previous experience flying the Tu-104's predecessor transitioned reasonably smoothly to the new model. Still, the Tu-104 was considered a complex aircraft to fly. It was not only heavy on the controls and too fast on the final approach, but also had a tendency to stall at low speeds due to its highly swept wings. The type was implicated in dozens of accidents during the following decades, with no less than 36 by the 1980s. Yet the most famous did not happen until early in 1981, when the worst military aircraft crash in the history of the Soviet Navy claimed the lives of 28 high-ranking personnel. Another Winter Day the Tupolev Tu-104A, serial number 7660402, was completed in November of 1957 and later deployed to the Soviet Navy. On February 7, 1981, the aircraft was stationed at the Pushkin Airport near the city of Leningrad in northern Russia, waiting for its VIP passengers. For the past week, the highest-ranking officers of the leading Soviet fleets had gathered in Leningrad for an annual meeting to discuss their advances against the capitalists. During the event, the Navy's Commander-in-Chief, Sergei Gorshkov, personally congratulated the Pacific Fleet for their extraordinary service. The plan was for a large group of top officials to be flown across the continent to the Soviet Union Pacific Fleet headquarters in Vladivostok as soon as the conference ended. The scene was somewhat lively at the Pushkin Military Airport that day, with all the gathered officials excitedly discussing the results and future plans they had just talked about. Still, eyewitnesses did not recall anything odd. The weather was snowy and the runway icy. It was a typical winter day with slight crosswinds. The fully loaded airliner lined up on runway 21 at 6 p.m. and commenced its takeoff run, but right after rotation, its nose pitched abnormally. The aircraft then stalled in mid-air and banked sharply to the right, a mere eight seconds past liftoff and 50 meters above the ground. As it continued to roll, the Tu-104 nearly inverted and plummeted to the ground just 20 meters from the departure end of the airstrip. 
Moments later, the wreck burst into flames, ignited by the 30 tons of jet fuel it carried for the over 9,000 kilometer flight that awaited it. The airport's personnel rushed to the scene immediately, but the heat did not let them get near the site for some time. Only one person was found alive as he was expelled from the nose, but he eventually succumbed to his injuries on the way to the hospital. 50 passengers lost their lives, 44 of which were Navy servicemen, including 16 top admirals and generals of the Pacific Fleet, leaving the unit virtually beheaded. Only three Soviet admirals had been lost during the war by then, and now the Navy had endured over five times that amount. The accident could only mean one thing. War. A suspect. One of the accident's casualties was the commander of the Pacific Fleet, Admiral Emil Spiridonov. With their most robust fleet now severely crippled, the remaining leaders of the Soviet military assumed that the tragedy could only be attributed to an enemy's special operation. They firmly believed that the astute opponent neutralized all those Soviet leaders so the fleet could not resist a powerful forthcoming attack. Therefore, all units in the Pacific were put on high alert, but an attack never came. Meanwhile, soldiers at Pushkin were tasked with combing the nearby woods for any top-secret documents or other clues left behind by the attackers, but the authorities eventually realized that the attack couldn't have come from the outside. The accident was thus deemed as internal sabotage. Convinced that the crash was caused by someone who desired to replace the Pacific Fleet commander, the investigation dug out an incriminating detail. All of Spiridonov's officials had perished along with him, except for Vice Admiral Rudolf Golosov, the fleet's chief of staff and thus the obvious replacement. Despite being on the passenger list, Golosov did not board the aircraft, refusing to get in with the rest of the officers and thus becoming the prime suspect. However, as the investigations continued, it was evident that the officer had nothing to do with the crash. It was later found that prior to the meeting, Golosov had asked Spiridonov if he could visit his daughter. Given the positive outcome of the reunion, the Admiral gave him permission right at the end of the session, which clarified why Golosov was still on the passenger list. Ruling out external or internal sabotage, the Navy was forced to look deeper and find the real cause of the tragedy. Paper Rolls During the war, ordinary consumer goods were scarce in the Soviet Union. People were often forced to travel hundreds of kilometers to find food, as the small villages were devoid of essential grocery items, and the military was no exception. After every conference, the officials would go on shopping sprees and purchase all kinds of groceries and furniture. That February day in 1981, the aircraft's weight significantly increased with all the excessive cargo load. The experienced pilot, Lieutenant Colonel Anatoly Inyushin, complained about it, but his superior's orders prevailed. Making matters worse, the already unreasonable weight was distributed unevenly, making the rear abnormally heavy. In addition, Two 500-kilogram printing paper rolls needed on the opposite coast were loaded along with the officer's belongings. Inyushin calculated that he would need to lift off at a higher speed than usual, as well as raise the nose much later. While the official report, which claimed that the aircraft had taken off at speed far lower than needed, was true, it didn't appear to be the pilot's fault. The TU-104 required a takeoff speed of 220 kilometers per hour, but the black box revealed it had lifted at 185 instead. Eerily, the pressure recordings confirmed that it wasn't the pilot who had raised the aircraft into the air. It had done so on its own. With its center of gravity already too far to the rear, when the aircraft accelerated, the two unbound paper barrels rolled to the back and caused the nose to pitch up too early. There was nothing the crew could do. Hence, the aircraft took off at a slower speed than anticipated and an inaccurate attitude, which resulted in the machine stalling. When the Kremlin officials realized the actual cause of the accident, they kept it hidden from the public. Such grave incompetence could tarnish the Soviet Union's image, while the amount of shopping the communist officers did would reveal the regime's hypocrisy to the entire world. Consequently, the investigation files were not made public until after the fall of the Soviet Union, and even the officers' widows received the official notice two years later. All remaining TU-104s in service with the military were grounded after the incident and a memorial for the deceased was built in Leningrad. Thank you for watching our video. Please like and subscribe to all our Dark Documentaries channels, and let us know your thoughts in the comments section below. Also, click the bell icon to be notified of our newest content, and stay tuned for more historical anecdotes.